as the time drew nearer for this conference, I was sitting in my living room one day. I was daydreaming, trying to think of something profound or something uh, wonderful that I could come up with to share with you today. Uh, I am the only non-doctor, I am the only non-pastor who is speaking to you in the next couple of days. And so I have to try to be profound because I don't have a whole lot else that's interesting about me. So I'm daydreaming and I'm trying to figure out what the best method is to portray biblical authority in our lives to you today. And I'm dazing off into the distance and my little two-year-old Patricia walks up to me and she says, Daddy, sing Jesus Loves Me with me. I said, oh, she couldn't tell I was lost in thought. And she kind of wrecked the train of thought I was on anyway. I said, okay. So I started singing Jesus Loves Me with her. And it hit me. I started to pay attention to the words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. These are truths our young children sing, but they are sung into their heart to teach them that they can learn things from the Bible. And so I started to think from that aspect. I started to think of different aspects of authority in our life, and I realized that they've all been instituted for the Bible tells us so. You think of government. Government was instituted by God in His Word. You think of the authority of the church. You think of the authority of the pastor. It was instituted in His Word. You think of the home and the authority structure that is found in the home, and where was it instituted? In His Word. There's a lot of authority that we can learn from in the Scriptures. Now, today I want to share nine different reasons or different aspects of the Bible's authority in our lives, if I can. Um, I am 33 years of age, and in my short life I have noticed that it seems that our country and our world has sprinted away from any kind of biblical authority, whether it be our public school system, our college systems, or things like that. We see that the world is trying to get away from biblical authority, and yet look and see how we've become less and less civil and become far more violent as a human race. It's very discouraging because we've gotten away from biblical authority. Someone once said that public schools will not allow the Bible. They will not allow prayer. But both are encouraged in the prison system. Maybe if we had it more in the school system, there'd be less need for the prison system. And what a legitimate point. I wish I had been smart enough to think of it myself. But what an encouraging thing to think of, that the Bible has authority in our lives. My first point, the Bible has authority in our lives because it is authentic. There is nothing fake. There is nothing forced. There is nothing feigned about the King James Bible. The hymn writer uh, Halder Lelanus wrote the song, The Bible Stands. One of his verses says, The Bible stands every test we give it, for its author is divine. By grace alone I expect to live it and to prove it and make it mine. Psalms chapter 12 and verse 6 tells us that the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. I had a man in our church bring some necklaces to me. He had found them in his mother's effects when she had passed away. And he gave them to me and he said, brother, if they're worth anything, then you can take the money uh, for your ministry. And so I suspected uh, that they might have been costume jewelry because of a couple of different factors. But I took them to a, a store where they, they purchased gold to have them tested. And they were willing. They brought out a magnet. And the magnet is designed to attract metals that are often used in jewelry that they will put a coating on and they will mask the fact that it's not gold. And so, sure enough, they brought out the magnet, they held it over, and the necklaces jumped off the counter towards the magnets. At first appearance, to an eye that wasn't very bright or did not understand what true gold is, they looked like gold, but the proof, if I can say, was in the pudding. The proof was in what they were attracted to. What's my point? The finishes on the necklaces looked like real gold. But what was inside spoke differently. There are many versions of the English Bible that at first glance and appearance look to be authentic. But what's inside speaks differently. They jump 
to worldliness. They jump to a motive that's not pure. They jump to a motive that's not authentic. There are some that appear to be advertised as being clearer, better, more authentic to the original virgins, and all sorts of things. But yet, they're not authentic in their heart. We see them jump towards the world and towards its ways. Now, Dr. Stringer mentioned last year, uh, if you were able to attend at the conference that we had in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, that he talked about the newest versions of the Bible and how they are constantly advertised as being the replacement for the King James Bible. Why? They're trying to mimic the authentic words of Scripture. In all my life, I have never seen a replacement to the concordant literal version of 1994. Why? Because it's not authentic, and by now everyone knows that. I've never seen a replacement for the easy-to-read version with modern English of 1989. Why? Because by now everybody knows that's not authentic. Our scriptures are authentic. We do not have to worry about that. When I was doing research for this message, I looked up the phrase, the word of the Lord, and was amazed at how many times it occurs. 38 times alone in the book of Ezekiel. My Bible has authority in my life because it is authentic. Number two, my Bible is useful. The Bible isn't a book designed to be a reference for when all else fails. Sometimes as men, we have a reputation of when all else fails, we read the directions, or when we finally discover that we are completely lost, then we will ask for directions or consult our GPS. The Bible was never intended to have that kind of an authority in our life. It teaches us how to maintain proper and profitable relationships. It teaches us how we are to react to mankind and to God. As one man said, in a nutshell, the Bible is God's how-to book for all those ranging from imbeciles to intellectuals, from sinners to saints, and from those who are novices to those who are knowledgeable. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Sometimes we get to where we feel we need to stop at the first half of the verse where it says all scripture is given by inspiration, but then we don't look and see why it was given by inspiration or for what it is profitable. The Bible says it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, or instruction in righteousness. Someone before me, much smarter than me, said that doctrine tells us what's right. Reproof tells us what's not right. Correction tells us how to get right. And instruction in righteousness tells us how to stay right. That's what our scriptures are useful for. When you realize how extensive the scriptures are in our lives, you realize the authority that it has and how useful it is. I work, as, as Dr. Brown mentioned, I work with a, a religion. I try to evangelize people from a religion that are taught that the Bible is a primary source of authority. In practice, often, it is the last source of authority. But, scripturally speaking, we can look and see that it is our final authority. Number three, my Bible is trustworthy. Being honest or trustworthy is an invaluable character trait that is seemingly less and less found in people. People are not trustworthy. They need contracts. They need things signed before you can count on them to hopefully do it if they can't get out of a contract. There was a time in our history as a nation where a man's word was as good as his bond or where a handshake sealed a deal. I had an opportunity in times past to do business with a lady when I owned a small business and she insisted not on doing contracts but shaking hands. And at first I thought that was unusual, but it wasn't that she was against contracts, she was testing me to see whether I would maintain what I had shaken on. After she realized I did, then she would do more business with me in the future because she found that I was trustworthy. On a much higher, better scale, our scriptures are trustworthy. We've already seen that the word of the Lord is pure and purified seven times. Now, the Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 18 and verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. David says that God's ways are perfect and his word is tried. 
Psalms chapter 34 and verse number 8 tells us, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Your attitude towards God's word is the same as your attitude towards God itself. If you treat one with doubt and cynicism, you will do the same to the other. You cannot separate your attitude between the two. David said that those who trust in God will be blessed. Psalms chapter 119 and verse 42 says, So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. David was a powerful man and had many, many enemies. But sometimes the psalms that he wrote were full of prayers because his enemies had nearly overcome him. If you look at Psalm chapter 17, you will see a classic example of just that. But through it all, David could say that he trusted in the word of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 105, he wrote, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. David trusted the words of God to direct him and lead him in his life, and we certainly should do the same. Remember that Psalm 119 is by far the longest chapter of the Bible and was written with the theme of God's Word in mind. Nearly every one of the 176 verses say something about God's Word. Uh, it calls it words, precepts, commandments, testimonies, judgments. The list goes on and on. Jesus, in John chapter 17 and verse 17, was praying to his Father, and he said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. My Bible has authority in my life because it is trustworthy. Fourthly, my Bible has authority in my life because it is heaven sent. We saw the uh, definition of inspiration in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 16. Inspiration simply means God breathed. But the means of inspiration is the Holy Ghost. In 2 Peter chapter 1, if you were to read it, we won't turn. But you would find that Peter is writing in verse number 16 that the apostles hadn't followed uh, cunningly devised fables, is the term that is used there, or things that were made up by man for selfish reasons or for some selfish purpose, some agenda to be pursued. Verse number 9, he tells the reader that we have a more sure word of prophecy even more sure than the eyewitness accounts. You say, how can that be? It is possible for people to witness something with their eyes and have a different report. If you paid attention to the news recently, you can understand what I'm saying. If you don't agree with me, go watch a rival football game or basketball or any sporting event and sit between fans of both sides. And you will realize that there are two different games that are occurring in front of you, even though you only see one. Why? Eyewitnesses can have a skewed view. That's not the way our scripture is. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20 and 21, knowing the, this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Let me pause here for a moment. Sometimes people will quote this scripture to try to say that the Bible doesn't mean what it says or says what it means, and then they will proceed to give you their private interpretation. But be careful when you grab a sword by the blade and start to swing it. Sometimes it can cut pretty close to you. It's not of any private interpretation. Verse 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The words of Scripture didn't come to the prophets as they meditated or as they thought but they were given to them as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It wasn't a situation where God took a thought from his mind and placed it in the thought of man and then just lived with the results. Holy men of God were moved. Paul withstood Peter in Galatians chapter 2 because he was at fault. If man was allowed to add his flavor or his influence, we would not have a very clear and perfect scriptures. In this day of smartphones, we have an option. It's called autocorrect. And there are times your device might change what you text to what it thinks you should text. And there have been times I've been guilty of looking down at my phone and saying this. If I meant to say that, I would have said that. That's a device. Can you imagine if God let man autocorrect the words of Scripture? Can you imagine what we would get? 
There have been times that I've tried to type out a text and I proofread it before I send it. And sometimes there are words there that should not be there. And they sound and look nothing like what I intended to be typed. Man certainly could have done the same thing, but God didn't allow it to happen, did he? My Bible is heaven sent. When you get a version of the Bible where an ecumenical group of cults or isms are consulted as for their opinion or what they think it should actually happen, you have much more than autocorrect to worry about. In Job chapter 32, we see Elihu's message to Job after the others had spoken. In verse number 8, he says, But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. He had sat and listened to the other speak first, and he understood that there is a certain spirit that man has, but it's the inspiration of God that gives us understanding. Our Bible has authority because it is heaven sent. Number five, our Bible has authority because it is outstanding. I don't have time to get much in detail in regards to this, but let me tell you a few statistics and a few quotations, if I can, about our outstanding King James Bible. In the United States, those who own a Bible fall under a classification where 55% of them use the King James Bible. I was startled to hear that it was that high. Second place is the New International Version, or NIV. I'm not sure which NIV, but it is an NIV at 19%. What does that mean? Nearly three times as many people recognize that the King James Bible is superior and it is outstanding more so than the NIV. Guinness Book of World Records labels that the Bible is the most printed book in history at an estimated 5 billion copies. Second place at 900 million is Mao Zedong's quotes. You can think for a moment and realize that many of those copies would not have been written out of free will, but out of necessity or direct order. Huffington Post, that not so credible news organization, had a series of articles where they listed books that were most printed after the Bible. They didn't want to even include the scriptures in their articles. Huffington Post also has uh, estimated that 3.9 billion copies of the Bible have been printed in the last 50 years. I'm telling you, my Bible is outstanding, and even the world understands and recognizes it. Our Bible is outstanding because it covers from history, from creation to the end times. Some of the displays that you see out here in the hallway are outstanding records of his creation that you can look at. I would highly recommend you take the time to do so. The Bible is outstanding because even those of great influence in the world have recognized its authority in our lives. George Washington said it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, my home state, said if we will not be governed by God, then we will be ruled by tyrants. Teddy Roosevelt said a thorough understanding of the Bible is better than a college education. Andrew Jackson said, referring to the scriptures, that book is the rock on which our republic rests. Ronald Reagan said, of the many influences that have shaped the United States into a distinctive nation and people, none may be said to be more fundamental and enduring than the Bible. In my office, I have a collection of older books that have been given to our ministry over the years, and one of them is the New Testament that was given to a GI during World War II. In the front, the following letter is written. To the armed forces as commander-in-chief, I take the pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible to all who serve in the armed forces of the United States. Throughout the centuries, men have many faiths and diverse origins have found in the sacred book words of wisdom, counsel, and inspiration. It is a fountain of strength and now, as always, an aid in attaining the highest aspiration of the human soul. Very sincerely yours, signed Franklin D. Roosevelt. Can you imagine having that today to our armed forces? Men of old understood that our scriptures were outstanding. Next, our Bible has authority because of its revelation. 
In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, the Bible says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Moses was addressing the people of Israel in his farewell address, and he mentioned that some things are secret and they belong to God, but there are some things that are revealed unto us. Where are they revealed? In his word. We can find them in his word. I was speaking to a man not long ago. He was going through a crisis, and he told me, he said, Mark, I can't seem to find God. And he said this over and over again. And I asked him, I said, have you read your Bible? No. I said, I know where you can find God. Why? Because that's where God reveals himself to us. If you want to see God and what he wants to tell you, go to his word. It is his love letter to us. You can find God's will revealed to you in his word. Oftentimes, when we are uh, coming home from church or, or some activity out, I'll ask my wife if we need to get something uh, from the grocery store when we come back towards our home. And one particular evening, my wife had a long list. And by and I say long list, uh, to me that means more than one. And so I said, I'll go in on one condition. You text me the list. Otherwise, I'll get inside the grocery, look around and think, um, I don't remember what it was. So sure enough, she agreed to. I parked the van and I started to walk into the grocery store and my phone vibrates. And I looked down and it said, text from my wife. And my first thought was, what does she want? I was just there. And then I realized she was revealing the list to me that I needed and I had requested. Sometimes, as sinful men, we think, God, what do you want? When he's just trying to reveal what we've been asking for, or more importantly, what we need. We should be patient and read the revelation that God has in store for us. Next, the Bible has authority in our lives because it is inerrant. Now, inerrant is a word that's not commonly used, but it means to be infallible, impeccable, or free from error. People pick at it. Why? They usually want to justify something in their lives. And if they can discredit it or try to find error, then they can justify something else. Be wary when someone tries to pick at the words of Scripture. The Bible tells us in Psalms chapter 19, verses 7 through 10, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. You know, there was a, a, a tune to that song, and you can sing it like a chorus, and you can enjoy the words, but David packed a lot into those four short verses of Scripture. Um, in verse number seven, he refers to the law as being perfect. He refers to the testimonies as being sure or without variance. Verse eight, he calls the statutes of the Lord right, pure, and lightning to the eyes. Verse number nine, he calls the judgments of the Lord true and righteous. Verse number 10, he calls the judgments more desirable than gold, more than fine gold. And then he calls them sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. David understood that the scriptures were inerrant. 2 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 31 says, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust him. I didn't duplicate verses if that sounded familiar. That's identical. Psalm chapter 18 and verse number 30. That's on purpose. God's not trying to fill a word count. He's trying to make a point. His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 29, as well as Mark chapter 12 and verse 24, both have Jesus speaking to the Pharisees after his parable with the husbandmen. Remember the story and, and how they had uh, mishandled the servants and then ultimately the son. Uh, but Jesus tells them that they had erred because they didn't know the scriptures or the power of God. It's important to have a right relationship and right attitude 
towards the inerrant scriptures. Psalm 119, verse 118 tells us that error and deceit is a result of departing from his statutes. We can rest assured that the words that we have in our King James Bible are inerrant and they are infallible. God promised to preserve his words. They have authority in our lives because they are inerrant. Number eight, my Bible has authority in my life because it is timeless. The Bible stands, the hymn I quoted earlier says in another verse, the Bible stands like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal and they glow with a light sublime. You don't have to worry about it going out of style. The Bible says they are timeless. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, the first part of the verse, you see the Bible says, For I am the Lord, I change not. I've said this before, but one of the things that I like most about math is it doesn't change. You don't have to worry about it. What 2 times 2 is today is the same answer it's going to be tomorrow. Languages change. Science's opinion change. If you don't believe that, pay attention to something they call climate change, and you'll find out. But the Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. I was having a discussion with a man once, and he had been a friend for some time, and he was uh, talking about women pastors. And uh, he could tell instantly how I felt about the matter. And he says, well, we need, to, we need to think differently. I said, well, I've got scriptures that talk about that. He says, I know what scriptures you're thinking of, but times change. And I said, times do change, but God doesn't change. And neither does his word. And what God said then is what he meant then and what he means now. One of the things when I worked with juvenile delinquents that I discovered was, even though I was typically rather strict, amongst my peers I was considered to be strict, was that the, the juveniles were happier in my care or when I had them for various activities because I was consistent. What was wrong on Monday was wrong on Thursday. What was wrong for Bobby was wrong for Jimmy. And it wasn't that I was special, it's just I felt what was right was right and what was wrong was wrong. It didn't matter who or when or why. We can count on that in scriptures. The scriptures are timeless. And we can base our hope and our faith and our trust and our love on what the scriptures say. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 89 and verse number 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness, not to this generation, to all generations. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 24 through uh, the first part of verse number 25, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, but the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. I think it was Brother Randy King said that the cemetery is full of irreplaceable people. They thought they were irreplaceable, but they sure weren't, were they? And that's the way it is with man. But the words of the Lord endureth forever. Psalms chapter 100, verse 5, David wrote, For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. We've already seen that Jesus prayed to his Father, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. But let me tell you this. Somebody doesn't need 28 different editions to get to the bottom of truth. It can be found in your King James Bible. My Bible has authority in my life because it is timeless. Lastly, the Bible has authority in our lives because it serves as a yardstick. In Hebrews chapter 11, we can compare our faith to the others God has honored in His Word in the Hall of Faith. 1 Corinthians 13, we can see whether we measure up to the biblical definition of love. In Matthew chapter 23, we can see how we measure up to hypocrites. And we can see instruction on how not to be one. The phrase, do as I say, not as I do, came from the Scriptures. We can use it as a yardstick. You can read 1 John or the No-So book to see the biblical definition of a Christian. Paul told the church at Corinth to examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. How do you do that? You use the Scriptures as a yardstick. 
God did not put us here on earth and then left us be and say, you know, uh, make the most of it. Do the best you can, and then we'll see how all things weigh, weigh out at the end. No, he didn't. He gave us a yardstick that we can measure ourselves. In Psalms 119, verse 35, the Bible says, Make me to go in the path of thy commandments, for therein do I delight. David wanted to be placed in the path of the commandments. A path is something that is definite. It is real. And it is measurable. Let me give you an illustration. This morning, I left the college campus and went up to Milwaukee to pick up uh, Pastor Longsline, my dad, from the airport. I was on a very real path, Miss Garman and me, taking this path. But you know what? I could look at her screen and tell whether she was leading me the right path and how much further I had to go. It was very real, it was very measured, it was very definite. And sure enough, my GPS she got us there in a very real way. You can see how you progress. The Bible tells us in James chapter 4 and verse 8 that we are to draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. How can you cleanse and purify? Psalms 119 has already told us that we can cleanse our way by taking heed to God's word. We can purify our hearts that allow us to draw close to God. My Bible has authority in my life because it is a yardstick. In short review, the Bible has authority in my life because of its authenticity, its usefulness, and it is trustworthy. The Bible has authority because it is heaven sent, outstanding, and is God's revelation to us. Lastly, we've seen the authority of the Bible because it is inerrant, timeless, and serves as a yardstick. If you take all nine of those points, take the first letter, it'll spell out authority. The Bible has authority in our lives. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for the attention. Thank you for the privilege and honor to be here. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the many facets and aspects of authority that it has in our lives. Help us to take heed unto it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Dr. Brown.